following program is classified G. It's suitable for all ages. We would like to remind our viewers that the views expressed in this program by our participating guests are solely viewpoints of them who take part and does not reflect the views and beliefs of the Verana Media Network. Hello and welcome to another episode on Gen XYZ and we are talking about on this program on contemporary topics or issues based on the youth. Now before starting our program, I would like to start off with a set of questions. How many times do you check your phone per day? How many times do you check your email? Or when was the last time you sat down with your family at the dinner table without having someone with their headphones on or someone on their tablets or phones or someone watching their teledramas? That's right, so this has been a persistent issue and this is the topic we are going to talk about on digital addiction. And to talk about this topic, we have Dr. Meera Chandadasa, who is a consultant, child and adolescent psychiatrist. Doctor, you are not new on this show, you have been with us a couple of times as well. And thank you again for joining us on this program. Now, Doctor, to start off our discussion, there's this saying where people are telling that, you know, teenagers or millennials are always on their phone but to my knowledge it's not just the millennials it's always the adults and the young children also who have been addicted to some sort of technology it doesn't have to be the mobile phone per se either it's a tablet or the television or YouTube or video gaming like it's not set to a particular age per se now so to solve this problem doctor there should be some root causes I want to know from where this problem actually started. Right. So first of all, when I was a child, if I want to watch my favorite television program, I would have to wait for one week. And sometimes, if it's on Sunday, if it's at 3 p.m., suddenly at 2.45, it starts raining and lightning. So the mother says, don't watch it because it's not safe to switch on the television. So you wait for another week. So there was not this entity of constant stimulation. So when we watch something that we like, when we eat something we like, when we watch a cricket match and we win, when we win the cricket match, this stimulation comes from stimulation of our reward pathway. Reward pathway is a neuronal network that runs from the midbrain to our cortex. For example, let's say we are watching a cricket match between Sri Lanka and Australia. And the last ball, Dashun Chanaka is required to hit six runs and he hits six runs and Sri Lanka wins. That sense of accomplishment, happiness comes from the dopamine release in the reward pathway, then we feel happy. So usually, you always do not win cricket matches and that kind of a uh, scenarios do not happen all the time but if you have a phone in your hand you can watch whatever you want you can listen to Taylor Swift then you can shift to uh, someone you like Ed Sheeran or something within a second so you can stimulate your brain and make dopamine release in the reward pathway constantly when our brains get set into this constant stimulation when you don't have it, you feel very empty. So people sometimes keep the phone a little bit away and take the book to study. But after a few minutes, your hand goes to the phone because in that void, in that emptiness, you feel bored and you feel you can't tolerate the nothingness. So this is in every generation. You can't accuse the teenagers or the young people like you. We are also the same and also they are sort of like a social role modeling. Sometimes the kid may want to play with the ball, but the mother is reading something on the phone, or father is checking emails. So that kind of a social role modeling is also there. So the social influence plus the biological aspects both get together, causing a lot of screen use in young people. So doctor, this biological aspect, do you think it was there from the beginning itself, or it was something that deprived throughout the years? 
Yes, so it's a very interesting question. What we call is impulsive temperament. Impulsive temperament is where uh, you take decisions very quickly. For example, let's say you know a friend for a couple of years, it's one of your good friends, and suddenly she or he makes a very quite rude remark, maybe about your dress, maybe your, about your hair, then you suddenly respond back. And when you respond back with anger, sometimes that person gets hurt. But this person you have known for years. But when you say something, your relationship gets affected. So in that instant, what impulsivity means is how fast, how intensively you respond something back. So a less impulsive person, who is a calm person, when he hears something rude, he will think, okay, this friend I have known for years, she knows me very well, just let it go, you don't react back. But if you are a very impulsive person, before you think about the consequences, you have already responded back to her. And she is hurt, you are hurt, and your relationship is affected. So when you are an impulsive person, what we call impulsive temperament, you are more prone to get addicted to screens. So because people with impulsive temperament don't like to get bored, so they constantly want this. So this impulsive temperament was there in the human civilization for centuries. For example, in the olden days, people with impulsive temperament would have gone to war when other people sit back at home and relaxed. And maybe later, uh, people with impulsive temperament must have taken to bungee jumping, fast car racing, risky stuff. But now, that impulsive temperament can be expressed on a screen. So the biology was there, how it expressed has changed. That's right, doctor. But now, considering the social factors, what are the main social factors that you think that you know people are digitally addictive to technology? In mainly teenagers, it's the peer influence. So sometimes a lot of kids come to the clinic and tell me, Dr. Uncle, now you are telling me don't play this video game all the time. But out of my nine friends, eight of them play this game. So what do you expect me to do? When we get together, everyone else talks about this video game. When we are not playing this video game, we are watching videos of people playing the video game. right? So there are all this discussion interest is about this video game. So when I do not play this game, you are excluding me from this fun discussion I can have with my friends. So this peer influence is very influential when you are a teenager because in the middle teenage years from 13 to 16, your self identity is forming. You are not sure who you are. That is the time we wear uh, different dresses, do different hairstyles. So because of the self-identity formation, you are not sure who you are. Your identity is still forming. So you are more influenced by what your peers think. So sometimes and at our age, what others think about what I wear doesn't matter a lot. But at 15 years, it matters a lot. So when everyone else is using a screen, when that is the norm to have a phone, if you don't have it, you feel uh, left out. So that is also very important. Another factor, doctor, is that when I did my research also, some factors also came up on the uh, my research websites. It's that, you know, parents are also finding a way to find some ease when parenting their young children. Parent, the easy way out would be, you know, handing their phone over to their child or put on their favorite cartoon on their mobile phone or their television so that they can have some peace of mind. Hmm. But do you think that's the right thing to do? Because as soon after, you know, the parents take away the phone from their little child, children tend to, you know, throw tantrums and scream and, you know, they can't seem to let go of the device. Do you think that's the right way to parent? Most parents are extremely busy these days. Mothers work, fathers work. So when the child is bored and distressed, the child is likely to put up a temper tantrum. Temper tantrum is a brief episode where a little child is angry and reacting back to something he doesn't like to when he gets bored. So usually from the 18 months to 4 years, having temper tantrums is a quite normal part of psychological development. But maybe if 
uh, 30 years back when the child was having a temper tantrum probably that family would have had four other kids or seven other kids and that would have not be a huge problem there are grandmothers aunts to deal with this thing but when you are the only parent or you are both are working when this child is having a temper tantrum rolling on the floor or screaming it affects your work maybe you are working from home as well you have to check some email and your child is disturbing so you tend to give the device and you get uh, immediate results you give the device the child is calm then what happens is the child and the parent both become a prisoner of this relationship with the device now when the child's mind is set for that kind of excitement when the device is not given child becomes extremely bored he continues to scream so it becomes a pattern of behavior that uh, reinforces itself with ongoing giving of the device sometimes parents need to take a step back let the child scream not give the device so what happens when you don't give the device for the first day they scream more than usual they come to the clinic and say doctor you said not to give the device now he is screaming too much yeah. that is not good advice but they will increase how they protest but you have to sit back and wait couple of weeks then they will get adjusted and obviously you have to introduce many other activities like playing passing the ball taking him to the ground singing if you when you take off a device from a child you have to replace that emptiness with other activities so that is why sending children to preschool at the correct age is very important another thing doctor now you said taking away a device from a child it's it could help but do you think at this time and age uh, do you think the right age to give a device at that age is correct Okay. because like when i was young it, uh, my mother always used to say until you are 18 you are not allowed to have a mobile device but now you see little toddlers also using mobile devices and it's sad to say you know pe- uh, children they don't ask for toys anymore they don't cry and ask for balls or dolls or anything of that sort they would demand for ipads mobile phones or airpods so do you think that's normal uh that is a controversial subject for example would you value more if i have the skill to uh, hammer a nail into a wall or whether i can book a ticket to melbourne within 5 minutes maybe 30 years ago maybe putting up a nail would have been more important but now maybe maybe even booking a flight may be more important without actually going to a office you just stay at home and book a flight so these kind of technological advances and skills are very important for the modern world so you can't deprive children of device it's only that you have to promote self control what do you mean by self control self control is where the person who's using the device decides most of the time when to start and when to stop so for example it is like screen currency you say if you go to school do your homework eat your lunch you can have one hour of screen it starts exactly at 5 finish at exactly at 6 pm if you return the device at 601 you will not have the device for 24 hours so that kind of a self control you can't start from the first day there should be some order routine and schedule at home but it should be very clear if it's 6 pm you can have for one hour tomorrow as well but if it's 601 you will not have the screen for 24 hours but you can have now for children you should not say things like i will never give the device to you those things are not practical so there should be clear rules when you establish what we call clear behavior limitations it works in the long run the next question that arises doctor is how much is enough time and how how old is the correct age what's your answer to that so there are different recommendations made by the american academy of pediatricians and american academy of child and adolescent psychiatrists but those standards are for the western culture and may not be clearly or directly appropriate to us but generally what we say is that 
below the age of 2 years, before the age of 24 months, it is usually not recommended to give any screens for child. What I usually tell parents is, if your child is less than 2 years, don't even watch news when the child is awake. Wait until the child goes to sleep. From 2 to 5 years, generally, non-educational screen time, that means uh, watching a cartoon, watching an appropriate kids program, maybe up to 1 hour is okay. But from 2 to 5 years, educational screen time, there is no actual limitation. For example, let's say there is no petrol and diesel. Child is supposed to go to the nursery, can't go. The child knows the teacher. Teacher is a well-known adult for the child. To have interaction with the teacher, there is no limitation. Because it's not just watching a cartoon. You interact with the person over the screen. The teacher sings, the child responds. There is no clear limitation. So, there are some limitations for non-educational screen time. But for a toddler, educational screen time with the appropriate adult, maybe there are no clear limitations. But after five years, uh, it, there, are, there are no clear uh, cutoff for screen time, but you have to limit it as according to the child schedule and personality development. All right, Doctor. I think we spoke about parenting and the toddlers and their addiction to digital devices as well. Uh, in the next segment, we are going to talk about the teen life and how adults are also significantly uh, addicted to digital devices as well. But before that, let's go into a short commercial break. We'll be back soon and you're watching Gen XYZ. Welcome back to Gen XYZ and we are in discussion with Dr. Muru Chandradasa, the consultant and child and adolescent psychiatrist. Doctor, in the first segment we spoke about you know, how young people, small children are addicted to their technological devices and how parents can control this aspect. Now when coming to the young adults or the millennials, like they are all significantly addicted to especially social media or gaming. Like day and night I've seen people just in their phones or on their uh, Xboxes until you know even if they have a free time they are always in their rooms and parents are complaining like this child has a little free time and that free time also he is spending in his or her room playing video games but when I spoke to the children what they say is uh, Aki we can't spend time with our parents anymore because they are also always on Facebook or watching YouTube videos so then we have nothing to do. So we have our Xboxes, that's when we occupy our times. And another reason why children are addicted to social media is because they want that external validation. I feel that they have faced a lot of childhood trauma or sexual abuses and their teachers or parents they just don't appreciate that child so they are looking for external validation through social media just to get that extra like or comment or someone to say that you're pretty on social media what are your thoughts on that doctor okay i like rugby a lot but if i don't go to the hospital clinic and i'm always at a rugby match i'm not fulfilling my responsibilities would you call me addicted to rugby so that is a difficult thing to understand. Many parents think all teenagers, if they are given 100% access to internet and devices, that all will be addicted to screens. Actually that does not happen. There are several factors that lead to teenagers getting into screens. First thing as we discussed uh, on the first session, that the impulsive temperament people who take decisions very fast and who get upset very easily. That is one factor. The second factor is attention deficit state. That means if my attention span is only 5 minutes, that 5 minutes is not enough for me to read a chapter on the science book because it requires 15 minutes. So on the half way, I get distracted and I lose track of what is explained there and I feel bored. But 5 minutes attention span is more than enough for a video game because every minute the screen changes 
so you feel so comfortable in the on the screen rather than on the book so short attention span the third thing is lack of coping skills ability to tolerate emptiness a lot of little kids and teenagers say oh this is a long journey uh, my father is driving I feel so bored I have nothing to do like that they whine about so ability to tolerate emptiness and comfort yourself by something thinking something happy imagine about something maybe not trained for a kid when they are becoming teenagers the fourth thing is permissive type of parenting so there are different parenting styles one type is called permissive parenting style so that means the child have unlimited options for example let's say you have cake uh, cooked dal rice and potatoes for dinner the child looks at the plate and say i don't want to eat this stuff i want chicken then the mother says okay there's no chicken but can i make you an omelet so there are unlimited options so there are no clear boundaries for your choices then what happens when they come to devices also they have no limits so if these factors are there in a home more likely that teenagers and also adults get into the habit of using devices so what young people say is true adults may advise young people but they themselves are on screen so i think the most important thing is a phone curfew time or a screen curfew time on a designated time like 6 to 10 pm nobody in the house should use devices so that is the interaction time in the first week obviously the teenagers are going to complain it's so boring there's nothing to discuss but gradually they will develop more activities that are more engaging and exciting so that time becomes more fruitful so having a screen curfew time at home is a must these days doctor you mentioned the ability to cope with emptiness is lacking in these young people mm -hmm. but then when you see people going out uh, with their family or even with their spouse or let's say their girlfriend or boyfriend when i go out i see people or couples they're always on the phone they have a person to interact with but still they choose to stay on their phones and not interact physically with each other so how can you say that this is a lack of uh, coping with emptiness okay now when you consider cognitive stimulation and excitement generated by a stimulus it depends on the intensity of the stimulants and how much control you have over it for example now if i'm watching a cricket match the batsman may hit a four or six maybe every 10 balls so between those period there's not much of a stimulation but if you are playing a video game you are constantly shooting people or killing people and there's constant stimulation is every second so when your excitement is set to that limit anything below that becomes so boring so even when you are with your partner the partner may say something interesting once in a while but the partner cannot replace the smartphone which gives constantly you can watch a video for 10 seconds move into the another one so you know as uh, most new social media has videos very short so there's constant stimulation so even the smartphone is more stimulating than someone you love so that is why even when they go out they are on the phone so i think young adults also should decide if they are going out there should be some limits on screens and the next thing doctor is now those days we used to compare ourselves with our friends with the grades we have with the amount of dresses we have or something of that sort but now children are comparing themselves with the number of followers they have with the number of likes they have on their pictures is that normal is it okay to normalize this uh, now uh, in teenage years self esteem is building up for self esteem in the olden days the teachers would have said you are a good student i'm proud of you or the parents would have said we are so proud of you now because of the social media following that external validation as you said comes from strangers sometimes people you don't know so 
if your self esteem is low that means you are not proud of yourself you are more vulnerable to seek that external validation especially when parents are highly critical and hostile to children they do not develop this kind of a self esteem when they grow up because all the time what they would have said is that if they would have gotten 70 out of 100 for maths the mother would say uh, try a bit harder next time maybe you can get 75 maybe when they have made something uh, nice maybe a creation the father would have say it's nice but uh, the, your cousin made something even fantastic so every time there's comparison that is coming from uh, our culture so when they grow up they get the feeling all the time i'm inadequate i'm not enough i'm i'm a disappointment also because of education system is very exam driven because every time there is some standard that is difficult to meet so because of our ex our education system is not competency driven the objective is not to develop uh, uh, develop a team work in a team respect others but the objective is to get a certain mark because the exam driven educational system so you are very competitive when it comes to external validation and development of self-esteem also you are become competitive so this has become an issue and there are a lot of celebrities famous people on social media which are who are trendsetters because these of trendsetters you see Lionel Messi, Cristiano Ronaldo, Taylor Swift, Katy Perry they have millions of follow-ups so young people think in order to be happy I want the same thing but it is not so because for celebrity it is that 24 7 job but for a re real life person it may be not something we can achieve the next uh, disadvantage doctor is that I see there's a depreciation of skills or values in the future generations or when coming down the line through generations because we see our grandparents and our parents they're highly skilled in you know their physical aspects or their general knowledge but when we come to the young generations they must be topping themselves in the virtual world especially in gaming they must be earning a lot of coins per se that's what they do in gaming and the most number of likes or comments that's what they conquer in the virtual world but when they actually have to step into the real world they find it difficult to communicate in person with someone else that's because you know they are able to text over the phone but they can't verbally talk to a person what can you say about that that there's a depreciation of skills there so in south asian cultures certain aspect of intelligence is not valued so much for example what we call procedural memory and procedural skill for example how to change a light bulb how to fix something broken at in your home so those kind of skills are also part of intelligence because intelligence is multifaceted so it may be reading a book and understanding the content it may be uh, fixing a lock it may be listening to music and understanding the tune so the actual intelligence is multifaceted so when that happens in our culture because of the exam driven education system uh, the cognitive intelligence marks grades are all the time valued if we visit a relative's house usually the aunties and the grandmothers ask no how much did you get for this exam but never an aunt comes and asks uh, son can you uh, fix a doorknob or can you uh, make a tea or can you uh, make an omelette or something like that they never ask so those kind of procedural skills are ignored in our culture but if you go to the western world so i can remember when i was training in australia sometimes in the house that we lived in if something is broken like a window pane or something is broken when I call the helpline, they would ask, why don't you fix it? Because in a developed civilization, they actually fix most of the thing at home because procedural skills are valued. So, uh, 
from the younger ages we have to make children independent allow them to develop skills and allow them to make mistakes most of the time what we do is we create what we call the fear of failure for example let's say a child is running fast here and there we say don't run if you fall you are in trouble then the child doesn't listen and fall then the first thing we ask is i told you no i told you not to run but the first thing we should ask is how are you are you hurt so that running fast is a skill that he has to learn as assess the risk by himself and come to decision by himself so because of that creating this fear of failure is not a good thing that is something we need to change okay doctor let's go into a short commercial break we'll continue this discussion right afterwards you are watching gen xyz and we will be back soon Welcome back to Gen X Y Z, and we are talking about the digital addiction in people, the youth and adults per se. And in discussion, we have Dr. Muru Chandra Das, a consultant, child and adolescent psychiatrist. Doctor, my next question to you is about the exposure to the internet. Now, the internet is at the tip of your fingers. You can easily access information, and a lot of people are now self-learning. And even students, I have found myself they're saying, we don't have to go to school. We can easily learn from the internet. But yes, it's true. I accept the fact. But the thing is, they are being exposed to different things which they are not even supposed to know at certain ages. For example, pornography, and they think that's the reality, and they try to implement themselves in that virtual world. What do you think about that, doctor? So long time ago, when I was in Australia, a teenage boy came to me and said, "He is learning to make bread." So I thought he is going to a bakery and uh, watching adults make bread. But actually, he was doing a degree on making bread. So after three years of time, he is going to have a degree certificate, and he is going to be an expert. He is going to start his own bakery and become a professional at it. So sometimes, using internet and online techniques, we can gain skills which are not. existent in our near by environment for example maybe there are a lot of aspects maybe in journalism that are no there are no such experts in sri lanka so rather than you going to a western country you can learn that from here so there are a lot of benefits from internet and online learning but sometimes what people think is everyone using internet are quite normal people but you know there are certain group of people in the world who have anti social personality traits their intention is to harm other people maybe through fraud maybe to expose children to inappropriate content so these kind of people with anti social personality traits are they are in internet and they can be very harmful for children so that is why if you are allowing children to use devices there should be some software installed to protect certain content on internet second thing is browsing the internet history the browsing history at the end of the day and checking it is very important most parents say i don't have time to do that i don't know how to check the browsing history it has been deleted you cannot say like Uh, if you are a parent you know how to change the uh, diapers same like that you have to learn to check browsing history and the use of devices should be in a open area most of the time teenagers use the devices inside a room it's okay for a class because you need some quietness but unless that the children should be using devices in the living room so all the adults can see what's going on on the screen rather than at the corner of the home so they should be aware and the parents should connect this virtual world with the real world because there is a lot of disconnection between the virtual world for example the child may be playing a video game throughout the night and living in a character that is not actually existent in the real world but in the real world when he goes to the school because of 
large disparity between these two words, he feels bored. So, whenever parents, they should shoot what the, uh, choose what the child watches and also make that connection. For example, now one of the famous cartoons children watch is either Peppa Pig or Shaun the Sheep. They are, even though they are animated characters, there are some lessons we can connect with the real world. For example, let's say, uh, if Peppa Pig decides that working in a team is more important and more useful than working by herself, during the practical trip or while you are home, you can impart that knowledge and skill to your own child. So making the connection is very important. Doctor, I asked a few children, uh, why do you play video games so much? What is so interesting here? What's the satisfaction you get by earning these coins or killing people around you? They're like, they, the answer they gave me was that we can be anything that we want online. In the real world, we can't. There are rules, there are regulations. People are expecting me to be someone else, which I don't want. But in the virtual world, I can be anything that I want. I can wear anything what I want. I can do anything that I want to do. It gives me the freedom to live freely. Isn't that a dangerous statement, doctor? Because they feel scared to live in the real world, but very comfortable to live in the virtual reality. Yes. So character stimulation or ability of a person to obtain a certain character in some video games is highly addictive. So what happens is most of the time intelligent teenagers understand that this character that I have in the video game is actually not practical in the real life and they completely understand that I need to earn money, one day I have to do a job. But then there are certain role models on internet that goes against those values. For example, there are video gamers, professional video gamers, they say, I became a millionaire. I became a billionaire by playing this game. So what the teenager doesn't understand is, one million teenagers in the world have tried to be that one person. Everyone else has failed. One, that person has become a millionaire. So they see only the successful person but they don't see all who have failed taking that pathway. So this kind of uh, media attraction, so that person will have one million followers on social media, but the people who have failed trying to achieve that position do not have million followers, so you don't know their stories. So because of that, children have to, uh, we have to help them understand that not everyone you see is the real picture in the world. And also, uh, parents need to have a good emotional relationship with the child, so they have a two-way conversation. So sometimes on internet, if a child is exposed to something dangerous, first time they will come and tell mom or dad. The reaction of the parents would be, oh my god, don't watch that. How, how did you watch it? And maybe followed by a punishment. If you don't have enough emotional space for a ch your child to come and discuss something neutral and have a two-way process discussion, the next time the child will not come to you. He will go to a friend, she will go to a friend or may not go for anyone. So they may tread on a pathway very dangerous for a long time, get into trouble until we know. Sometimes fathers tell me, doctor, I didn't know only when I got the credit card bill, I understood that this amount of money has been taken from my account for my son to play the game. So we have to always have a two-way conversation to understand them better. The main problem now, again doctor, coming to teenagers again, they tend to, you know, commit themselves with suicide just because they feel that they are not pretty enough, that they are not validated enough on social media. That's a very crucial sector because parents are feeling the brunt of it when their child commits suicide just because he or she doesn't get a like on Facebook or a heart on Instagram. What are your thoughts on that? Because this is very detrimental now. People are trying to kill themselves just because they are not popular on social media. Okay. Now, sometimes kids who come to my clinic in the hospital, they say, uh, my father, was, father died of COVID. My mother is now working as a housemaid and today morning I have not eaten. I am hungry now when I came to the clinic. 
So we provide some food for the child before we see the child because we can't assess a hungry child because it's obviously emotionally distressed. But also, if you talk to a child maybe in Colombo 7 or maybe in New York or London, a girl may be sad that her iPhone is not working. So when you take two of these circumstances, you may think the person, the child who is hungry should be the more sad person. The other one should not be sad, but it is not. It's a personal perspective, how you feel. So the person who is complaining about my iPhone is not working, or I have i12 but I don't have the iPhone 13 and sad about it. So it's a personal perspective. So you can't make judgments on how others feel. When it comes to suicidal ideation, suicidal ideation is not very uncommon. In the modern world of adolescence, suicidal ideation or self-hatred, self-harm is a part of personality development. A lot of parents panic when they see something on their phones, a text saying that I hate myself, I want to leave this world. It doesn't mean they are planning on self-harm, but that what this means is that they are in emotional distress. So when the child, the teenager in emotional distress, because we panic about seeing that statement, we try to control them too much. Then that emotional di distress can increase. So what you have to do is, okay, my teenager is having some sort of problem, I need to get some professional help. That is what they should do. Then seek, talking about uh, seeking help, Doctor, we are reaching uh, our end of the session as well. As my final question, how do young people identify, okay, I do have a problem, I am being addicted to technology too much, I need help. Where can they reach out to? Because particularly, they won't be comfortable reaching out to their parents because, as you said, they might not make them feel uncomfortable. That two-way communication is not available, especially in our culture. So where do they find help and how do they accept the fact that, okay, yes, I do have a problem and I need a solution for this? Okay. To understand that I have a problem means there should be significant changes in behavior, thoughts or emotions. I will give short examples. Behavior means I used to be very punctual, now I am late for everything. That's a clear behavioral change. Change in the thoughts. I used to be optimistic, pleasant. Now I think this is not going to work, uh, I'm, not, I'm going to fail this exam, very negative kind of thinking. Change in emotions, I used to be a smiling, pleasant person, now I'm angry all the time. If there is such drastic change, you need help. If you want help in Sri Lanka, the best way is to dial 1926 or send a chat message to 1926. That's the National Mental Health Helpline. It's 24-7. A trained nursing officer will answer the phone or see your text message and respond. Or else you can call uh, the hotlines available from Sumitrayo, hotlines available Shanti Margam, which are non-governmental organizations which are very helpful as well. So if you think you need help, you need to seek help before it's too late. There is this stigma also, doctor, where you know when these hotlines they feel that okay I don't have a mental problem why should I be calling someone else just to satisfy my needs or my problems why can't I solve it by myself per se do you think that's recommended for the young people okay now that occurs because of internal stigma that means when people say mental health they imagine a, a person screaming running around with untidy hair unbrushed teeth. Actually, it's not. Most of us have mental health, significant mental health problems. One out of four all adults have a significant mental health problem and 50% of significant mental health problems start by the age of 14, 75% start by the age of 34. So the young people are the vulnerable group. So mental health is part of life. You should not compartmentalize it and see it as something that it is not relevant for us. It is relevant for all of us because there is nothing more important than mental well-being. So if you remove your own stigma, you can uh, seek help at the appropriate time.
All right. Thank you, Doctor. And we've reached the end of our program as well. And with this discussion, I also feel that, you know, technology is developing every day and it's up to us to control ourselves and limit ourselves and also up to the parents to uh, control their children as well. Again, thank you, Doctor, for giving your insights on the program as well. Hopefully, we'll get to meet again on another program. Thank you so much. Thank you. And that was our episode on Gen XYZ. We will be back again next week with another problem or issue or topic based on the youth. And just in case you couldn't watch us on air, you can always rewatch by catching us on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash English. Stay safe, have a good night. I'm Suzanne Chinali.